everything is different. We cling to the familiar all the same. Nostalgia is probably the opiate we need right now. Probably not like this, but hey, we're all in uncharted waters now, boy. I didn't see Spider-Man because it isn't available on demand. Oh, you want hard-hitting opinions? 2020 and 2021 were great for disabled and immunocompromised people who couldn't get to the theater. We haven't been to the theater since 2019, and I'm honestly not sure if it's a thing my body can even do anymore. I'm not super great with uh, stairs and dimly lit areas, it's just different now for me and my journey with illness. I want this perspective out in the world. Not everyone is able or ready to go to a theater right now. Theaters are the for-profit presentation of art with popcorn. And uh, sometimes the market fluctuates outside of the film. You know, it, oh. uh, in 2022, YOLO is... A cautionary warning? I'm not. We saw so many movies last year, it was amazing. Here's an opinion that will get me yelled at on, you know, YouTube. Your experience is not everyone else's experience. Know what? Let's keep on the difficult opinions train. I loved The Matrix Resurrections, but I didn't love it as much as other films this year. It felt a lot like a COVID movie to me because it was and is. The effects work is pretty spotty in places, and normally I wouldn't bring that up, but in a Matrix movie, I think that is worth bringing up. There's a lot of post-production slow motion, but it's the best first 45 minutes in a movie this year, bar none. Go see it. It was a great year for musicals, though I haven't seen West Side Story yet because of the aforementioned theater thing. I know Willems and Sedant loved it, so... Willems and Sedant, coming this fall to NBC. Ridley Scott made a spiritual uh, sequel to Kingdom of Heaven, and I have no idea why he told this story, but I did love it, though mileage here is going to vary. He visually tells the hell out of this story, and Adam Driver is the most willing actor to take on characters that are purely made of muck and grim pathos. I adore it. You found your niche, boo. It's gutter trap. Summer of Soul was an outstanding and informative documentary, and let's be honest, the world needs more quest love in it. And The Sparks Brothers was a super fun and insightful documentary as well. <clears throat> also, just to be honest, I do still watch Fire Festival documentaries all the time, but now I refer to them as the classics from the old world. Criterion, get on my level. Mitchells vs. The Machines, a perfect touching little movie, pig dog, pig loaf of bread. And personally, for Tara and I, a lot changed for us in 2021. The year just kind of shot by as we furiously worked every single day to rebuild our home. So buy some shirts and pins and stuff. We're going to be paying this off for a moment. Oh, and we shot a new deep dive back at the house. That felt like a win in a year of losses. It was a strange year where a lot of creators monetized a show about, uh, let me just, oh, fighting to the death in extremely tragic fashion to make enough money to survive. I'm sure no one will misinterpret the point of that show. Hey, here's a spicy true fact. Mr. Beast was already Squid Game. Probably it should go on the list every year. Some moments from film stick with you. The shootout at the end of LA Confidential, the reveal in Arlington Road, the ending of Six Feet Under. Every single time I watched In the Mood for Love in 2020 and yelled, see they get it. It's the magic of cinema. And by that I mean every single one of these moments for me started on DVD on a 2002 Panasonic CRT. Cinema is magical when it creates moments that will never leave you. I thought we had a connection. Okay. How old am I? 
what are my hobbies? Moments that will define you as a person, so please understand the weight of how deep we are about to go here. Promising young woman will haunt you. Emerald Fennell, Camilla Bowles herself, writes and directs this indictment of The Nice Guy, an absolute maelstrom of a performance from Carey Mulligan, an absolutely devastating portrait of where society is at. This movie will live rent-free in your head for the rest of your life. You're welcome. Goodbye. I said, what are you doing? No movie better illustrates the need for an audience's simple binary definitions of things than The Suicide Squad, James Gunn's lovingly outrageous reboot cool uh, thing. The top two questions on Google for this movie are, is Suicide Squad 2021 a reboot? And of course, is 2021 Suicide Squad a sequel? And the answer to both questions is a definitive yes, followed by an inquisitive no? It's hard enough to take another swing at a property with the same cast that was already profitable and just do it again but great this time. And somehow it celebrates the wild chaos of such a ridiculous comic series in the cinematic form while simultaneously crafting a loving and understanding movie about people who let the rat guy drown. Uh... Sorry... Weasel. Who is going to live through this one? Discovering that is the fun part. A movie so good at its job, I forgot for one joyous moment that we weren't living in this suspended state of super hell right now. Kudos, James! That's what movies are supposed to do, take you somewhere else. It loves its team of idiots like its own. Yeah, they already know they're on the farm team. Captain Boomerang is on their team. Also, apropos of nothing, Jai Courtney is my perfect Captain Boomerang. I'm Team Jai! And it was a special movie that spoke for all of its tossed aside characters. Many of these characters had already failed at the box office, some more than once. It allowed Harley to exist in her own space, like visually. And while we're at it, freaking invent new film awards for the genius of King Shark. A truer hero of cinema there has not been. I loved this movie. I absolutely was not going to put a comic book movie on the list this year, but that's how good this movie is. I think James Gunn is a refreshing voice in both cinema and the comic film space right now. I absolutely adored The Suicide Squad's attitude. An absolute bullseye. The thing about a Dune movie is that you're still chasing the dragon even after you conquer it. The film was profitable when a lot of factors were stacked against it, and in the weeds McCarthy era exploration of super drugs imperialism space politics. Shit, that sentence actually kinda checks out. If Dune bombed during a pandemic, Hollywood wouldn't have touched this story again for a decade or two. Movies about military families and psychedelic space drugs don't often see the light of day and never get to cost $160 million with a director who has dreamed about nothing else for his entire life. Oh, and this is a COVID movie. They did finish all of their principal photography in 2019, but they did do additional photography in August of 2020. A great deal of the post-production on this movie was done in the most divided of circumstances. Dune was a behemoth accomplishment. They hit a home run with the sun in their eyes. There's a second half to look forward to as, make no mistake, this is the first half of a really big movie. I think if John Carter showed us anything, it's that having reverence and the ability to make a love letter to literature from a bygone era with a substantial budget does not equal success. I respect this movie, wherever it sits in the pantheon of evolving ideas and tastes, Dunny Villeneuve and crew filmed the unfilmable, and now I'm Duncan Idaho or die. Bad boys for life. Dune's been around for a minute, and there are more stories about trying to make a Dune film than studios and directors that actually managed to. 
This is a masterwork. I absolutely cannot wait to see the second half of this adaptation. Bravo, Danny. Hmm, I should say something surprising here because everyone and their dog knew I was going to put Edgar Wright on this list. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Last Night in Soho was the single greatest season of Project Runway ever made. Boom. When you realize how right I am by that sentence, you're going to be like, God damn, that Mikey dude talks about culture like a sociopath. And to that I say, you gotta make it work. Ah! Last Night in Soho is a bombastic look at using history as interpretive artistic voice, not anchoring yourself to it. Wow, what an apt metaphor for the metaverse age where everything is a little bit of everything all of the time. Welcome to the Cracked Menagerie, a celebration of giallo, also known as the color yellow if you speak Italian, a type of horror first popularized in the Pantone 102 Italian murder mystery horror novels of yore. Yeah, I did look up the Pantone. This entertainment type echoing quickly through cinema, this movie is Edgar Wright in the unsubtlest of nutshells. If we do not learn from the past while celebrating it, then what are we doing? Nostalgia with no attempt or intent to remix and find revolution is, please hear me when I say this, just content. I am on the side of artists who give a shit. They want to expand the conversation away from the people telling them to do the same thing all of the time. London is haunted by the ghosts of bad men. This movie is an outrageous tour de force of what clearly took a lot of rehearsal and thought. I'm always floored and surprised by what Edgar Wright attempts to do, an absolute home run of thoughtful precision and a beautiful film, an absolute home run of thoughtful, nuanced precision. Camelot lay the king all on a Christmas tide, with many a lovely lord and gallant knight beside, and on the table round did the rich brotherhood, high level hold aright and mitiful was their mood. Arthurian legend is an evergreen canvas for Hollywood, finding something new to say with it? Well, that sounds like my kind of movie. A sickly Arthur and Guinevere, you say? The dwindling moments of their long journey together, you say? David Lowry is a super intriguing filmmaker to me. All Them Body Saints, Pete's Dragon, A Ghost Story. Visually, this movie is a knockout like few films are, distant, desolate, isolating. Spiritually in the Excalibur wheelhouse, but a headstrong adaptation of a very specific story, though adapted in specific ways. Okay, here's some dorky Arthurian context. King Arthur stories are written by a litany of different authors over hundreds of years. It is the OG cinematic universe and characters from it gain popularity and stories of their own. Enter Gawain. I will be there. Arthur's nephew who in this film is asked directly by Arthur to tell a single story about himself. And he cannot do it because there is nothing to say. Gawain just kind of hangs around with legends his whole life, drowning in legends one would say when Merlin is across the room giving you stank face. In short, who is Gawain? The Green Knight spends an entire beautiful moving tone poem exploring this question. Gawain spends this movie imagining that he is fighting the Green Knight, but he himself is the Green Knight. You get it? It's like two, there's like two me. The Green Knight is a masterpiece, one of the best fantasy epics ever made, a classic in every sense of the word. Please come on by the Green Chapel and do not miss this film.